Hi, I'm Chris Wilson from Grinding Gear Games. Thanks for joining us for today's Path of Exile livestream. We have a packed show today, with announcements for Path of Exile 2, as well as the exclusive unveiling of Path of Exile Affliction, which launches on December 8th on PC and Mac, and on December 13th on console. Twitch drops are enabled on today's livestream, so make sure you follow the instructions below in order to claim your Huntsman Wings. We'll start with Path of Exile 2, where Jonathan will walk you through our latest announcements. Mark will then take you on a deep dive into the new Path of Exile Affliction Challenge League, which launches in one week. He'll cover the league mechanics, its rewards, some new content we're adding to the core Path of Exile experience, and some large metagame changes. I'll then show you our annual core supporter packs, and we'll head into our live Q&A session where Ziggy D will ask us your questions from Twitch chat. After the live stream, we'll drop the full patch notes. I'd like to hand over to Jonathan Rogers, game director of Path of Exile 2. Hey guys, it's been a few months since we introduced you to the Druid in Path of Exile 2, but one of the things that we're really focusing on now is how varied each of the classes feels to play. The monk darts around quickly from enemy to enemy, building and unleashing combos. If he doesn't stay in combat, he loses momentum and has to build it up again. The warrior, on the other hand, is like a slow but unstoppable freight train. A warrior commits to big attacks and relies on stunning his enemies to stay safe in the thick of combat. When an opening presents itself, a warrior can use even larger attacks to demolish his enemies. The Huntress seamlessly moves from melee to ranged combat and back. The true damage potential of the Huntress is only unlocked when you learn to combine ranged and melee abilities together. And then there are the Spellcasters. The Sorceress is a pure caster who much prefers to stay at range and drop powerful spells on her foes. If she finds herself surrounded by enemies, she would rather use an ability to escape than to take them on directly. The Druid is also a spellcaster, but unlike the Sorceress, he uses his spells as a means to support his melee abilities. And by melee abilities, we mean he can turn into a giant animal and rip his enemies to pieces. Each of these classes feels extremely different to play, but we want to go even further. It's time to check out the Mercenary. There's not a job out there I won't take. So long as the pay's good, and a crossbow can solve it. I'll take them all down, one bolt at a time. When thinking about each new class, we really try to think about how we can make combat feel different from all the others. For the mercenary, that difference is the crossbow. A crossbow is fundamentally different than a regular bow because it fires instantly instead of needing to be drawn back. This means that you need immediate feedback. Clicking the fire button should make the character shoot instantly, just like in a shooter. As soon as we experience that, we realize that there are a lot of design lessons to learn from shooters, and so we fully embrace them. In Path of Exile 2, we have crossbows that work like sniper rifles, shotguns, and assault rifles. But in order to really get shooter-like gameplay, we wanted to go further. In Path of Exile 2, we now support WASD movement. You can now walk around in any direction independent of aiming. In fact, if this is your preferred method of gameplay, you can use it on any class, regardless of what weapon type you're using. You can change between click to move or WASD at any time. You can only hold two crossbows at a time, but Path of Exile 2 is all about interesting combinations of abilities, and this is where ammo skills come in. This is a burst shot crossbow, and right now I have armor piercing ammo equipped, which makes it very effective when facing a group of enemies, since it pierces right through them. Bloody horrors! But there are other ammos too. For a bigger single target, it might be a good idea to switch to incendiary. The more projectiles hit the target, the stronger the ignite. So you'll want to get up nice, close and personal with this one. 
If you have a bunch of targets running at you, you might want to slow them down. In this case, you could switch to Permafrost Burst Shot. Shooting a bunch of smaller enemies at range will chill them, and potentially even freeze them in place. Once you have some frozen enemies though, you can switch back to Armor Piercing. Shooting a frozen enemy with Armor Piercing Burst Shot will explode the ice, doing a huge amount of damage to all nearby enemies. Another feature crossbows have is attachments. This is a grenade launcher. As you can see, when I equip it, it appears on the underside of the crossbow. These attachments are just like skill gems, so you effectively get extra skill slots. And you can augment these with support gems, just like regular skills. These grenades take a while to explode, so it's a good idea to pair them with some kind of crowd control, like permafrost burst shot. We have other grenades too though. This attachment is a flash grenade. It does barely any damage, but it does a huge amount of stun. It can be a great opener before you run into combat. Surprise! Now here's another attachment, an oil grenade. Firing one of these grenades coats the ground and nearby enemies in oil. Oil slows enemies down, so it's another useful crowd control mechanic. Now, another thing that oil can do is be set on fire. Any burning enemy or explosion will ignite the oil, causing extra burning damage. One of the problems with burst shot crossbows is that each pallet doesn't do much damage individually. This means that if enemies have armor, then it will be very effective preventing that damage. But thankfully, you can equip an additional crossbow in your second weapon set to deal with the weaknesses of your primary weapon. This is a rapid shot crossbow. Rapid shot is great for closing on enemies because you can shoot while running. In Path of Exile 2, we now have the ability to allow you to use some skills while moving. Being able to create skills like this opens up a lot of new design space, and allows us to really increase the pace of combat. The armor-piercing version of Rapid Shot slowly erodes a monster's armor. Once the armor is fully broken, you can easily switch back to Burst Shot to deal much more damage. Being able to run while shooting with Rapid Shot is also great for when you want to perform a fighting retreat. Reload. Using permafrost ammo with Rapid Shot is also useful if you need to retreat. When you shoot the ground it creates ice crystals. If you draw monsters back over these crystals they explode, chilling the monsters. It's great if you want to set up a safe zone before pulling the next pack. Slowing enemies down can come in handy if you want to use the incendiary version of Rapid Shot. Using this skill requires that you charge up a little bit before it fires, but as it continues to heat up it will do more and more damage. It has a really large clip size, so you can just keep firing and firing with it. But the other really useful feature is that when the crossbow is heated up, it adds extra fire damage to any grenade that you launch. Now I've been using explosive grenades here, but it will work equally as well with flash or oil grenades too. If you use it with oil grenades, the oil will catch fire immediately.
Another crossbow type that you can find is Power Shot. This one works just like a classic sniper rifle. Use it with armor piercing ammo and it will penetrate armor on targets. So it's a good idea to use when something's really tough. Back down or die. Now this skill has another interesting interaction with armor break. If an enemy has its armor broken, then your power shot hits a weak spot and does a huge amount of single target damage, with a bunch of extra stun for good measure. Now, the incendiary version of Power Shot is more like a rocket launcher. It does a big explosive blast at a distance. One of the really useful features of this version is that you can explode any grenades that happen to be on the ground. This combo also works really well with incendiary rapid shot. I'm going to charge up the heat on my crossbow, shoot out a bunch of grenades, and then start the fireworks with a power shot. The ice version of power shot creates frost walls at a distance. This is great for crowd controlling monsters and tight passages. The wall segments have other uses too. If they get destroyed by monsters, then they will explode, doing a small amount of damage. Lock him in. Now, remember that burst shot combo with frozen enemies we did earlier? That works with ice walls too. Let's put burst shot back on. Now I can fill up this area with ice walls, then shoot them with armor piercing burst shot for a huge amount of damage. Alright, it's time to face the boss for this area. Let's see how we fare against her with all the skills I've shown you so far. That's the Mercenary. It feels totally different than anything we've made before, and shows you the range of what's possible in Path of Exile 2. We're 
going to be showing off a lot more about Path of Exile 2 as we approach its beta, but in the meantime we've got a Path of Exile 1 expansion coming out next week. I'm going to hand over to Mark, also known as Neon, to show you what's in store for POE 1. Thanks Jonathan. Well, let's just go ahead and get straight on into it. Here's the trailer for Path of Exile Affliction. Something moves in the mists. Something sinister. Thorn. Rot. Plague. And claw. The affliction spreads. It hungers for more. Tread lightly in the wildwood which shifts and fights. Accept our help, the ancient power of the Azmiri. Beware the spirits that yearn for freedom. And the heart of evil that waits in the dark. I will be waiting. In the Affliction League, you will encounter sacred wisps, which beckon you to enter overgrown passageways that lead to the Viridian Wildwood. A vile affliction has covered this forest with a foreboding darkness. You will need to uncover the forest mysteries to put a stop to the source of the affliction. As you approach the darkness, the wisps burn away its affliction. Make sure you tread carefully, because they only have a limited amount of power. But be warned, the darkness is full of cursed monsters that emerge to kill you. As you explore, you might see other types of wisps trapped inside the darkness. The Wildwood is trying to guide you towards clues about its affliction. Follow the trails of wisps by collecting them, and you may uncover many different secrets. New characters to find, shrines, boss battles, and all kinds of new encounters are lurking in the forest just waiting for you to discover them. There are many rewards to earn for those brave enough to seek them. When the Sacred Wisps run out of energy, they will return you back to where you came from. Any other types of Wisps you have collected will return with you to Rayclast. These Wisps, having been saved from the Affliction, disperse into the environment and inhabit randomly chosen monsters in the area, increasing their power and also their rewards. The different types of Wisps have different effects on monsters and sometimes more than one type will inhabit a single monster, making the fight even harder and even more rewarding. If this happens to a boss, you could be in for a tough fight, but if you can overcome it, your efforts will not be in vain. Primal Wisps grant an item rarity bonus to inhabited monsters, Wild Wisps grant an item quantity bonus, and Vivid Wisps cause them to drop currency items. If a monster gets all three types, they'll drop more items of a higher rarity and a lot of currency. While exploring the Wildwood, you might find some of the last few Azmeri wanderers who have managed to survive in the forest since it was cursed. Each of them have different survival specialisations, and they are willing to teach you if you agree to help them defeat the source of the affliction, the King in the Mists. Choose which of the Azmeri that you will complete quests for to unlock one of three new Ascendancy classes, which you can have in addition to your regular Ascendancy class. Up to 8 points for these classes are unlocked as you complete more quests for the Azmeri you are training under. The Warden of Eves can teach you to become a Warden of the Magi, a powerful class that takes advantage of wilderness knowledge. A Warden of the Magi can learn to use tinctures which coat their weapon, granting various powerful effects. You can equip tinctures in your flask slots and toggle them on and off at will. You can only have one enabled at a time, but the effects are quite conditional, so you may want to have more than one equipped and swap between them during combat. 
For example, equip the Ironwood Tincture to gain the benefit of always stunning enemies on full life. Tinctures can also get random mods. This one in particular adds stacks of wither to targets on full life and steals frenzy charges on hit, which makes it great as an initiator. When you are fighting rare monsters or finishing off tough bosses, you will want to swap to the Oak Branch Tincture, which grants Culling Strike, increased damage against enemies on low life, and has a chance to steal a mod from rare enemies you kill. You can buy more tinctures from the Warden of Eves using Primal Wisps when you find her in the forest, so keep an eye out for her. As a Warden of the Magi gains more ascendancy points, they gain access to more skills that let them further specialise in tinctures. For example, Nature's Concoction allows you to invest in having your tinctures enhance your flasks. This ascendancy skill makes it important to think about which slots your tinctures are placed in, and what flasks they are adjacent to. You will have better uptime on those flasks and they'll be stronger as a result. But there are plenty more skills to choose even if you don't want to engage with tinctures. For example, another new ability to unlock is Barkskin. It's a reservation skill that causes bark to grow all over your body, increasing armor. As you take damage, the bark falls off, increasing your evasion. Over time, the bark will grow back, removing the evasion bonus but increasing your armor again. The Breaker of Oaths can teach you to become a Warlock of the Mists, an ascendancy class specializing in the darker arts of the Izmeri. One powerful ability you can choose is Blood Hunt, which grants an active skill called Ravenous. This skill lets you see what type a monster is under its life bar, whether it is a demon, beast, undead, construct, or humanoid. Consuming a corpse with the skill gives a buff to damage against that type of monster, and reduces damage taken by it. You can only have one type active at a time, so it's a good idea to choose wisely for the area that you are in. Some bosses like the Maven are eldritch in nature and don't conform to the regular corpses that you have access to, but don't worry. The Breaker of Oaths has a shop where you can trade wild wisps for corpses that you can place on the ground wherever you are. Buy an Eldritch Corpse and you will be able to get the bonus while fighting Eldritch entities like the Maven. You may notice that most of the corpses he sells are not monsters you normally encounter. You might want to try turning some of these corpses into spectres, to take advantage of some of the unique abilities that these monsters have. The Warlock of the Mists gets access to many other abilities. For example, there is a trio of curses that you can pick from. One of these curses targets your minions, giving them life degen and making them explode for massive damage when they are near death. One of them prevents enemies from dealing damage for the latter portion of its duration, which is quite powerful against bosses. This curse creates the interesting build decision of whether or not you should increase curse duration or reduce it. The final curse is a mark that causes enemy phantasms to be spawned when you hit the marked enemy. These phantasms aren't on your side, so they work well with on-hit and on-kill trigger effects, for example. The Primal Huntress can teach you to become a Wildwood Primalist. Unlike the other new ascendancies, the Primal Huntress lets you customize your tree. You do this with charms that you can buy from the Primal Huntress for Vivid Wisps. Charms have randomly generated mods, which give stats from regular ascendancy classes, allowing you to create your own hybrid ascendancy class. Charms are magic items that are aligned with different attributes. So for example, this Ursine charm is strength aligned and has gotten the melee hits have a chance to fortify stat from the champion, and the ability to stop your movement speed going below base from the juggernaut. This Interline Corvine Charm lets you get the stat that makes your Consecrated Ground effects linger from the Inquisitor, and the effect that makes Cursed Enemies explode from the Occultist. Some of the combination of mods that you might find for sale on Charms can be extremely powerful, so keep a lookout for the Primal Huntress's shop even if you are not playing as a Primalist. As a Primalist, you also get access to a few other interesting abilities. Use Warcries next to corpses and they have a chance to drop an extra item. It opens nearby chests too. 
The Primalist also gets access to a small extra backpack, just in case you find yourself needing to cart more items to town during your map runs. If you are unhappy with the class you picked, or you just happen to find a really great item for another one of the classes, you are able to change which class you are using next time you find one of the Asmeri Wanderers. Just remember that you will have to do their quests in order to gain the ascendancy points for that class. These quests will lead you towards the ultimate goal of the Asmeri, finding the King in the Mists, defeating him, and cleansing the forest of its affliction once and for all. There are new uniques to find, rewards to claim, and new ascendancy classes to master in the Affliction League. Now that we've covered what's in the League, let's talk about some of the changes you can expect to the core game in 323. For a start, Ultimatum is finally going core. When talking to players at Exocon, it was the number one feature that people requested. When playing through in-game maps, you may sometimes encounter the Trial Master, who offers you a choice to undertake a Deadly Val Trial in exchange for great rewards. If you defeat the trial, he offers to go double or nothing with you. Do you take the risk and go for an even better reward? Or do you take the winnings you have already earned off the table and go home? We've done a full rebalance of Ultimatum and have added many new mods and rewards, including both new and reworked uniques. The base number of rounds for an Ultimatum trial is now always 10, with a chance to spawn the Trial Master boss fight on the 10th round, if you are able to make it that far. As part of 323, we have also removed Metamorph from the game. All the Catalyst rewards from Metamorph have now been moved to be rewards for Ultimatum. We have also added a new Val themed Catalyst that works on corrupted items. As is normal for most content that gets added to endgame, we have introduced new Ultimatum passive skills to the Atlas Tree. One great example is the Keystone Grueling Gauntlet. It makes Ultimatums last three extra rounds, but you cannot choose the modifiers, and it prevents the final Trial Master boss fight from spawning. The level of challenge becomes extreme during the last three rounds, and not being able to choose the modifiers makes it even harder. But the rewards are insane, and for those with very high-end characters, it might be a bet worth making. There are lots of other Atlas passive skills you can pick from for Ultimatum, so choose wisely. Now, it's time to talk about one of the largest metagame changes we've ever made. There were three systems in Path of Exile that were all trying to subtly modify the behavior of skills. These were alternate quality gems, Labyrinth Helmet Enchants, and unique threshold jewels. We've combined all of these together to create a new system called Transfigured Gems that allows us to fully achieve the goal of these three systems and then some. Transfigured Gems are alternative versions of existing skill gems that have different functionality and balance from their regular versions. We have added a huge number of these with interesting variations that drastically change how existing skills play. For example, Frost Bomb of Instability. It changes it from a cooldown skill that you can cast occasionally for a large explosion into a skill that you can cast continuously but deals less damage and doesn't apply cold exposure. It changes the role of Frost Bomb from a utility skill into a main damaging skill. Another example is Detonate Dead of Scavenging. You can't use it on corpses that were created by Desecrate or Unearth, but in exchange it does a whole lot more damage. You won't be able to use it as your main reliable source of damage, but it's a great skill to use as a four-link utility to get some extreme burst damage. Ray Zombie of Falling. Instead of raising a zombie from a corpse, you summon them from mid-air. They fall to their death, dealing AoE damage where they land. While this sounds like a physical damage version of Firestorm, you should consider that it scales with minion damage and also triggers on-death minion effects. Blight of Contagion. This version of Blight is now spread by Contagion, so you can use it as part of your Essence Drain build. We have a huge number of these. Transfigure Firestorm into Firestorm with Meteors, Transfigure Blade Trap into Blade Trap of Great Swords, Transfigure Barrage into Barrage of Volley Fire, and so on. There is a lot to experiment with and we look forward to seeing what builds you can come up with. But how do you get Transfigured Gems? The divine font at the end of the Eternal Labyrinth has been changed to a gem crafting device that can modify your skill and support gems in a lot of new ways. One of the options you can now choose is to turn a skill gem into one of three Transfigured Gems. But that isn't all the Divine Font can do. It has a lot of other gem crafting options you can use. For example, you can add quality to gems, add experience to gems, sacrifice a gem for one or more treasure keys to open Azara's chests, and you can even exchange support gems for exceptional support gems like Empower or Enlighten. These are just some of the options you'll find the Divine Font is now capable of. In order to replace the rewards and heist that previously gave alternate quality gems, we have done a rebalance of the rewards of heist as well. 
Experimented base types have been rebalanced, new replica uniques have been added and old ones changed, and we have increased the amount of currency from display cases as well. On top of this, we have gone through and buffed the quality stats on most damage dealing skills. In most cases, they will be significantly more powerful than before, and also more interesting. Overall, this is one of the largest metagame shifts that we've ever done. There are so many crazy new skill combinations to plan around, so we expect to see some really interesting new builds. Next up, I'd like to hand back over to Chris to talk about the new supporter packs. At this point, we'd usually talk about the League supporter packs. We're doing things a bit differently this year. Rather than releasing League supporter packs today and then our annual core packs two weeks later, we have combined it all together into a strong set of core supporter packs that will be released alongside Path of Exile Affliction next week. The series contains five packs, each with its full value in points and a collection of exclusive cosmetic microtransactions. The higher packs contain physical merchandise. We'll unveil the full details of each of the packs at release next week, but in the meantime, here's a sneak peek of some of their exclusive cosmetic microtransactions. These packs will be available for purchase when Path of Exile Affliction launches on the 8th of December. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. We're just about to start the Q&A with Ziggy D. Afterwards, we'll post Path of Exile Affliction's full patch notes. With the release at the end of next week, our community team will be posting crucial information you'll need for Affliction's release. Keep an eye on the news. On release weekend, we expect to launch the new mystery box and this season's Kerex Vault Pass. Thanks for joining us today and checking out our latest developments. We're looking forward to exploring the Viridian Wildwood with you next week. We'll begin the Q&A shortly, so please get your questions ready.